Today we're going to wrap up my most ambitious build to date, the split top Rubo. In this video we'll focus on the base, chop, and getting everything assembled. So we got a lot to do. Let's get started. So we left off in the last video with the top completely assembled, and now it's time to focus on the base. And the first thing I need to do is cut down more of my 8 quarter cherry to create the legs. Now if you haven't seen the first part of this build, check out the card above so you can get caught up. And after you do that, come back and watch this. Or if you just want to watch the base and finale, stick around. So here, just like the top, I'm cutting my boards to rough length and then joining one edge. Now, since each leg requires two laminated boards, I'm only going to get one leg piece out of each board, so I need eight total. Which sounds like a lot of waste. But for this project, I wanted to start out with boards that were about 9 to 10 inches wide. This way I could cut out the stretchers, rails, and obviously the top with a minimal amount of waste. And so when choosing lumber for a big build like this, just know that there's inherently going to be some waste, and you can save it for another project later on. With that being said, let me know if there's any ideas you have for these strips down in the comments. So with my leg pieces all roughed out, I could take them back over to the joiner and then the planer to mill them down to a rough oversized dimension. Now again here, just like the top, I'm going to be shooting for boards that are just a little thicker than I need them to be. This way, after the glue up, I can mill them down to their final thickness. I will say though, after milling those huge logs in the first half of the build, milling these was a relief. Alright, so just like the top, I'm going to laminate the leg pieces using dominoes. And this again is just so that I have a nice flat reference surface when these guys are glued up. Plus, it helps alleviate some of that sliding around that happens when you meet two glued surfaces together. There's nothing worse than applying a little clamping pressure and then watching your board slide back and forth like a kindergartner at a playground. So once I had all the mortises cut into the boards, I could apply some of that glue. And here the glue up goes just like the top did, where we put a healthy amount of glue on both sides, and for this glue up again I used a roller. Then we apply as many clamps as we can and squeeze the crap out of it. This again is where having a lot of clamps makes a huge impact. And then we can say something like, yeah that's it, the legs are in glue. Alright, so once those are set up, again I can take those over to the joiner, then back over to the planer to thickness them down to their final width. And just as a side note, this is a really fun part of this project. Thicknessing the boards to final width at the planer rather than a table saw isn't my normal workflow, but since these are so thick, that's really the only option, and I think I might use it more often now. So with our legs dimension to their final thickness, we could cut them down to their final length. And for that, I'm just going to use my miter saw. And again, this is a result of the thickness of the pieces. In the past, I've been really hesitant to use my miter saw for cuts like this because I think my table saw and sled are a little more accurate. But for this build, I didn't really have a choice. And I gotta say that the miter saw worked out great. It is making me consider setting up a miter saw station in the shop, but we'll see how the workflow is after I get a couple months with the new bench. Alright, so from there I could start laying out the mortises for my legs. And the very first thing I do is mark out roughly where those mortises are going to live. This way when I start laying out the lines, if I don't see one of these marks, I know I'm in the wrong spot on my legs. After I've laid the joints out on one leg, I just use that as my master template to transfer all those marks to the remaining legs. This way all I have to do is set up start and stop lines for the router. And this gives us a great opportunity to start using that bench top. So once I have my edge guide all set up, I can start plunging the mortises. And to cut these, I'm using my same half inch spiral up cut bit. Again, this helps pull those chips out of the mortise and into the dust collector. Now, if you're having trouble cutting mortises or they intimidate you, just try this little trick. What I like to do first is plunge my router at each end of my mortise, creating two perfect stop points for my bit. And then from there, I just go back and take regular passes as I would normally. The cool thing about the stop points is that you can both hear them and feel them, so you know when to stop. Just again remember to cut from left to right so that the bit pulls the edge guide into the workpiece, and you should be good to go. Now I'm going to leave my mortises rounded. This way I can just round over the tenons and cut down on my work. But for these inch wide mortises, I do have a small ridge that's going to need to be taken out, and I just take care of that with some chisels. Oh, and for deep mortises like this, I do prefer a mortising chisel, but bench chisels would work just as well. Alright, so with all the mortises done, I can start focusing on the tenons for the top of the legs. So what I'm first going to do is lay those out and clearly mark them. And then from there, I'm going to take a marking gauge and mark a 1 inch line around the top of all my boards. This just lets me know where the shoulder is for all of my tenons. Now this part's super important because the tenons don't sit centered on the boards and they offset slightly on every board. So I really had to pay attention here. Now from there, I can take the workpiece over to the table saw where I have a dado blade installed and start removing some of that material. Now again here it's important to just take these cuts slow since there's a lot of material being removed here, but I just use my miter gauge and work my way from the top of the piece down to the bottom of the shoulder. Again double and in this case triple checking to make sure that I'm cutting the correct tenon in the correct place. I don't know why but when I start cuts like this I tend to think that I'm cutting in the wrong place or that I've made a mistake halfway through the cut, but thankfully that's rarely the case. 
Again, that's why I like to mark things out clearly. And speaking of things we like, if you're enjoying this video, give it a like. It helps the video spread to more people, and I greatly appreciate the support. Thanks. Alright, so with the tenons cut into the top of my legs, I can start laying out the drill holes for the drawbore pens. And what these pins are going to do is pull these joints really tight. So what I first need to do is drill two holes into each mortise for each of my legs. And what I'm doing here is drilling about two inches in, which goes past the inside of the mortise. This will allow those drawbore pins to curve around the mortise rather than just be pinned in place, like a pinned mortise and tenon joint. And while pinned joints do add some structure, they don't add nearly the amount of strength of what a drawbore pin will. In all honesty, a well-set drawbore pin joint doesn't even need glue. But we'll talk more about that here in a minute. For now I need to drill three dog holes into my front right leg. And again, I'm going to use my 3 quarter inch bit for that, and I'll start them over at the drill press and then finish them again with my hand drill. Only this time I was smart and recharged my batteries before this process, so it went really quickly. From there I drilled a bench dog access hole. And what this is going to do is allow me to get my bench dog that sits right over top of this leg out of the hole. If I don't have this hole and I drop a dog into the bench, it's going to get stuck. And again, because the leg is so thick, I have to finish this hole by hand, and I just do that with a Forstner bit extender and my Forstner bit. Alright, so I'm going to jump forward a bit in time here and skip over the milling process for the rails. I think you get the picture there. So here what I'm doing is laying out my final cut line and cutting them down to their final length. At this point, it's really important that these dimensions be spot on. If not, the base may not be square and the top won't fit on properly, creating a bunch of issues in the future. So once I had those chopped down, I laid out my tenons exactly as I did for the top of the legs. Again, here the tenons vary in sizes and in placement, so I really need to be careful about where they go. So when I cut tenons like this, I like to test the fit, and I do that by just taking a nibble off the end of the board. If I take a small bit off the end of the board and then test fit it, and it fits great, I'm good, and I can continue cutting the rest of the tenons. But if I need to make any adjustments, I can, and it's not going to affect the majority of the tenon. It'll only affect that top half inch. And another tip is to batch work like this out. So my blade height needs to be a half inch, I do all my half inch tenons. And then from there I can move the blade height and do the next set and so on. Alright, so the next step was to round over those tenons so that they would fit into our rounded mortises. And what I like to do is use my flush trim saw to cut a notch in all the way around the tenon. This gives a little relief for the chisels. And then from there I like to remove the bulk of the material using a chisel. Just be careful when working on the end grain like this as sometimes it can split and want to run on you. So if you start having that happen, just use your rasp a little sooner and you'll avoid that tear out. And speaking of which, I create that rounded corner using a rasp. This way I can remove a lot of material pretty quickly and then finish it up using a shoulder plane. Again, if you don't have a shoulder plane for tenons, you could use a rabbiting plane or a block plane and come back and flush that up with your chisels. So if you're finding all these tips useful, make sure you hit subscribe. I put out new videos all the time about woodworking tips, tricks, and furniture builds. So subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And thank you very much for your support. Ooh, that's satisfying. Alright, so next up it's time to mark the tenons for our drawbore pens. And to do that, I'm just going to use a brad point bit and a mallet. The brad point bit will center itself in the hole and give me a center mark exactly where the center of the hole should be. Once I have all the centers marked, I can disassemble everything and then use a combination square to mark out where the center of that pen should be. Now the goal here is to offset the pen by about a sixteenth of an inch inward towards the shoulder. So once we have the 16th of an inch marked, we can lay out a line so that we center our hole and then use an awl to reinforce the mark. This will create a nice starting point for the brad point bit. Again, what this is going to do is allow for that drawbore pen to go in and around the tenon, creating super strong joints for the base. Alright, so once I had all the holes laid out, they were easy enough to drill in using the drill press. Though it did take somewhat of a circus act to balance things and make sure they're even. I gotta tell you, the one thing I wish I had for this project that I don't is a nicer drill press. So if you're planning to take on this project and you have access to a better drill press, I would say take advantage of that and you'll save yourself quite a bit of time. Alright, so next up was to cut in a groove for my ledger strip. And what the ledger strip is going to allow me to do is create a nice shelf around the base of my bench. And to cut that I'm just going to use my table saw and a 3 8 inch dado stack setup. For my European viewers, you could also do this at the router table. Alright, so the final step for the rails was to drill in the mounting holes for the top. And I'm going to drill these oversized so there's plenty of room for the bolts to move around with seasonal wood movement. And the bolts that hold the top to the base are pretty massive so we want to give them plenty of room. Kind of like I give my wife after I tell her my next big purchase for the shop. Don't worry, it's healthy. Alright, so next it was time to move on to the leg vise chop. Which is just a really fancy way to say a jaw for the vise. Only this jaw is made of wood and it's huge. 
So for mine, I'm gonna use walnut. And I've had these slabs sitting in the shop for about two and a half years now, so they're plenty dry, but they're super cracked. And I haven't really found the right project for them. That is, until now. So once I've roughed the length out using a jigsaw, I can trim them down and cut them to rough width at the bandsaw. And then from there, I can take that piece over to the joiner and give it a clean edge. From there, I just cut the split out of the lumber so that I don't have to worry about it and created four boards. So once I milled the boards down at the joiner and planer, I took them over to the table saw to cut them to their rough width. I don't want to cut these to the final width yet so that I have a little wiggle room during the glue up. And from there, I can use some dominoes to help align the tops and glue up my two panels. Now normally I would say that dominoes weren't important for a panel like this, but I think in this situation, they are. I think they'll add some needed structure to those glue joints and give me a little bit more reassurance. So I'll let the panels cure for a few hours and then I could laminate them together. And I may have gone a little overboard with the clamps on this one, but you can let me know what you think down in the comments. Too many or not enough? All right, so I let the panel cure up overnight and then took it over to the joiner and cut a clean edge on it. And then from there I took the slab over to the table saw and cut it to its final width which in this case is gonna be nine inches. Now next I'm gonna clean up the top and bottom of the slab, but I'm not gonna cut this to its final dimension quite yet. I'm gonna wait until the whole bench is assembled and then cut it to its final length then. So just like the tail vise, on the leg vise I'm gonna be using Benchcrafted hardware. And for my leg vise, I went with the Solo model. So here I'm laying out the mortises and my screw holes on the left leg and chop. And once I triple checked my placement, I took the chop over to my drill press and drilled in the hole for the mounting pin. Now this operation was pretty tricky because the hole has to go all the way through the chop and it's obviously nine inches thick. So I did the majority of the work at the drill press and then finished it off using my hand drill and thankfully everything met up perfectly. So once I completed that same operation for the leg, I could drill in the through hole for the glide screw. Check out those balancing skills. All right, so next I could turn my attention to the large mortise that's in the center of the chop and the center of the leg. And since this is such a huge mortise, I decided to use my Forstner bit to remove the bulk of the material before going to the router. This saves a ton of wear and tear on the router, not to mention the bits and my stress levels. So once I had a hefty amount of material removed, I could go ahead and start cleaning up the mortise with the router. And to do that, I'll just take a couple passes using my edge guide to clean everything up. And I touched on this in the last video, but I think it's worth mentioning again, Anytime you're using the router to remove material like this, try to keep the material that you're removing on the opposite side away from the edge guide so that the router can pull itself into the workpiece. Next, I could route in a circle for the inset bushing. And this doesn't have to be perfect, but I have these templates and a templating bit, so that's what I used. From there, just route the hole until the bushing sits just under the surface. And once I had enough room, I could remove the template and just use my circle as my guide. All right, so the next step was to clean up those router marks using some chisels. And really what we're going for here is a nice smooth edge on either side of our mortise. We want this to be as close to 90 degrees as possible, so I took my time to make sure that things stayed straight. I got a comment on the last video about this chisel work taking a lot of patience on my part, but honestly, the truth is I just take my time because I don't want to lose my digits. You know, kind of attached to these things. All right, so with things looking cleaned up, I could go ahead and lay in and attach the base plates. For this, I just use a self-centering drill bit and pop in a screw. These base plates allow for the crisscross portion of the vise to not rub against the interior of the mortise. And with that, I could finally do my first test fit. And it was at this point I could finally exhale as everything seemed to be working as it should. Yeah. Next it was time to attach the hand wheel and the flange to the glide screw. And that assembly comes together pretty easily with a pen. Just make sure to add a little oil to the inside of the flange before you do this and that the pen is facing the correct direction. All right, so with our wheel assembled, we can drop it into the chop and lay out the screw holes to attach the flange. And we're gonna do that by shifting the flange left and right to find the center point and then center the flange within those two marks before dropping in a brad point bit to find the center of our holes. From there we can drive in some pilot holes and then use a tap to cut in our threads. Now the screws for the flange attach directly to the chop. So these threads need to be cut pretty accurately. So my best advice for cutting threads is to keep your drill on its slowest setting. Then screw down so you hit the bottom, put the drill in reverse and back the bit back out. If you find this tricky, just do a couple practice runs on a scrap board first. From there we can test out our threaded holes and make sure everything's fitting nicely. All right, so next I needed to attach the rear nut. And to do that, I'm gonna use the same process that I did for the flange, by using my pencil to find the center, laying out the three holes, and then driving in the screws. 
These are again some pretty lengthy screws, so I recommend some wax on the threads. Just be careful not to tighten them all the way down with your drill, instead go back with a screwdriver and tighten them down till they're hand tight. And from there I could attach the inset bushing. Now this bushing is oblong, so here I'm sure that the oval shape faces up and down on the leg rather than left and right. And from there I can reinstall the crisscross and try it out again. We are looking good. All right, so the last step before assembly was to create my draw bore pens. Now you could use dowel material for this process, but I decided to cut mine by hand because I have the tools to do so. And for my pens, I decided to go with walnut to again add some contrast. So once I have my oversized pens cut at the bandsaw, I just brought it over to my bench and used my dowel plate to start hammering the pens through. I first start with the half inch hole and then work my way back to the 3 8 inch hole. And just as a side note, this is a heck of a workout. And then from there, I can just use a razor blade to trim off the ends to make sure the pens go in the holes more easily. Another trick I found useful was to use just a pencil sharpener to round them over. And finally, the base was ready for assembly. So earlier I mentioned if you had good draw bore pen joinery, you don't really need any glue. But for the base, I'm gonna use glue and pens. Now I'm not using a ton of glue here, just a thin layer to spread it over the joint. If for whatever reason you wanted to be able to disassemble the bench, then obviously you wouldn't want to use glue in this situation. If you don't use glue, then you could always go back and drill out the draw bore pins and take apart the bench. But this is the more permanent solution and it's the way I wanted to go with it. One great thing about draw bore pins is the lack of need for clamps. Since the pins essentially are the clamps, I can just move from one joint to the next and put everything together. So assembly went pretty smoothly. So once I had the base assembled, I could move everything up onto the bench and cut out the ledger strips. And I just trim out the rabbits for those strips at the table saw. From there I can trim them down using my crosscut sled and then glue them in place. At this point I'm taking the measurements directly from the base, not the plan, since there might be a little bit of variance in there. Alright, so gluing the strips in is pretty straightforward. So I lay down a thin bead of glue and then just use a couple clamps to hold the strips in place. Honestly these joints were tight enough that they didn't really need clamps, but I figured better safe than sorry. Alright, so once the glue had dried, I could go ahead and flush trim the pins around the base, and then start cleaning up any of the joints that may have shifted during the glue up. My top rail was sitting a little high after the glue up, so I just used a block plane to flatten it back out, and made sure to carry that same adjustment all the way across the rail for a nice square fit. If I didn't do this now, the top wouldn't sit flush to the base, and we'd end up with some gaps. Next it was time to flip the base over and align it to the top. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, this process took me about an hour and a half. Since there's three individual parts, any small adjustment on one side meant that everything needed to be adjusted. So I found it best to just clamp down one of the tops to take it out of the equation. And then from there I can just use my pencil to outline the tenons. Next I went back to the router and edge guide to route the mortises. And I routed these mortises exactly as I did the ones in the legs. So we're not going to go over how I did that since we already did it. The only big difference being with these mortises is that when I got to the area where the tail vise lives, since the rails are already attached, I could only route a small portion of that mortise. The remainder of it I had to cut with chisels. So I guess in this case I would recommend a set of mortising chisels, but again I don't think they're absolutely necessary for a build like this. While the base was still attached, I went ahead and used my chamfer bit to add a chamfer around the bottom of the legs, and then I could remove any residual burn marks with a block plane. This way when the bench is dragged across the shop floor, I don't get any snags and tear out the bottom of the legs. Finally it was time to flip everything over and drop on the tops. Like a glove. So earlier I drilled in a bench dog access portal. And now we need to drill in a dog hole that meets up to where that portal lives. So I'll use my initial dog hole as a guide to drill into the top of the tenon. And then from there I just plunge all the way through until I reach the bottom of the portal. Since this dog hole is pretty tight and my fingers aren't that long, I'm going to square it off a little bit more just to give me a little bit more access. And then from there I can use my brad point bit to locate the center point for my pilot hole, flip the base back over, and drive in my mounting screws. Once again here it's a really good idea to put some wax on the threads because these screws are massive. Alright so with my two top slabs attached, it was time to get them flat. And to do that I'm going to clamp on two jointed sacrificial boards onto either side of the bench. And then I'm going to take some string and attach it to both rails and stretch it on an X pattern across the bench. Once it's offset by the same thickness that the string is, I can test to see if the bench is flat. So if everything's flat, when we touch the bottom string, the top won't move at all. And here we don't really have much movement. So next I'm going to make a quick sled to ride on top of these rails for the router. And once I cut an access hole in the base of the router sled, I can start passing this massive flattening bit across the top of the slabs. 
kind of like a human CNC machine. All I had to do was find the lowest point on the tops of my slabs and then set my bit depth to that. The only downside to a setup like this is that with a bit this large and the base this low, I can't use any dust collection. So flattening the top of the bench made one heck of a mess. I guess it goes without saying that you should definitely wear a mask when you're doing this procedure so that you don't destroy your lungs. When I'm done, I'm left with somewhat of a scalloped top, so I just hit the whole top really quick with some 180 grit. From there, we can check everything for flatness. And yeah, I'd say we nailed it. So next it was time to trim down the chop to its final length, and now that the bench top was attached, we could mark that out. From there, I headed back over to the miter saw to chop this trunk down. Now the base of the chop gets a little bit of a decorative touch. It's a whatever you like kind of thing. And I played with a couple different designs, but ultimately landed on this one, which was a nice taper at the base. So once I had my two tapers laid out, I brought the chop over to the bandsaw and cut down the line. Now again, you could go crazy with this with all sorts of inlays and decorative features. I just decided to keep mine pretty minimal because that's the style I enjoy. From there, I could lop off the top of the chop. Well, that was fun to say. This is to give me more breathing room when using hand saws. If we didn't cut this off, I'd be punching the top of the chop anytime I was trying to make a cut. To clean up the saw marks, I just use my bevel up smoother and it cuts through this end grain pretty easily. And when I finish that up with a card scraper, this top is super smooth. No injured hands here. Finally, my last step was to put a massive chamfer around the entire exterior of the chop. And being that this is a really big bit and it's a really deep cut, I did that in two passes. And while I'm buttoning up a lot of the odds and ends, I'd like to take a moment to say that if you're enjoying these videos, you find them helpful and useful and you want to support the channel, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon. There you'll get discount codes on plans and merch, an invite to the Discord server, and some other free stuff. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, be sure to check out the link in the description. And to those of you who've already joined, thank you guys so much for your continued support, it means the world to me. And I have some other cool stuff coming, so stay tuned. Alright, the finish line's in sight. So now that the chop is attached, I could use some rubber cement to attach the rubberized cork into the jaws. This both adds protection to the jaws, as well as gives me a little bit more grip. Then from there, I could rough cut the slats for my shelf. So my slatted shelf is going to be shiplap. And if you've seen my perfect cabinet build, you've seen how I've done shiplap before. As a quick refresher, what I'm going to do is lay out my panels in the orientation that I want them. Then I'm going to mark I's on one side and O's on the other. This way, I know that I can cut all my I's face up, and then cut all my O's face up, knowing that that will give me offsetting rabbits on either side of my slats. And to cut those rabbits, I'm again going to turn to my table saw and a dado stack. Only this time I'll use a sacrificial fence so that I can bury the blade and get a nice flush rabbit. Again, another option for this would be a router table, but let me know whether you prefer a router table or a table saw for cutting rabbits down in the comments. Next I could trim all the slats down to their final length. And to ensure consistency here, I just screwed down a stop block to the top of the bench. Or outfeed table, I guess is what this is now. From there, I could take a notch out of number one and number nine, or I guess I should say the two ends of my slats. And with the notches notched, we could check the fit. Thankfully, they dropped in perfectly, giving us a little bit of space for wood movement. But if they didn't, we could extend the rabbit slightly or just trim a little bit off the middle. From there, I was on to cutting down my gap stop. Now, my gap stop is nothing special, just a stick of eight quarter walnut, and it's about six foot, so it's a little shorter than the length of the bench. So after I've trimmed it down to its final length, I could just use my dado sack to trim out the notches for the rails and then drop it in place. Again, we don't want this to be super tight here so that we can leave some room for wood movement. Then from there, I could finish off the remaining dog holes on the back side of the bench. And to drill those, I'm just going to use a block I drilled out over at the drill press to help things stay square. From there, I could cut a chamfer onto every edge of the bench. And I mean every surface. Yes, even inside the dog holes. Those dogs work hard. They deserve a comfy home. From there, I gave everything a quick sanding, and then it was on to the finish. Now, for the finish on the bench, I went with Osmo 3043. This will give the bench some protection from glue and things of that nature without building up a film finish on the bench. And if you guys would like to check out any of the tools or items I've used in this video, I'll leave some links down in the description. Just know that I do get a few pennies if you do buy, but I would never recommend anything I don't use myself. So here we are. At the end of this journey, I can tell you that this project pushed me harder than any project I've ever made. And that was a good thing, because I wanted to build something challenging that I thought was going to push me to build the best possible piece of furniture for my shop. If you have a desire to want to learn the craft, I don't think that there's a better way to do it than to build a bench. But not just any bench. Build a bench that you'll use for a lifetime. 
There's something about making the environment you work in showcase your personality and the style of furniture you want to build. I guess the idea being that if you surround yourself with quality, you're going to continue to make quality. At least, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So if you enjoyed this project and you want to see others like it, make sure you subscribe. Check out this video over here next, and as always, I knew this would work. <laughs> I'll see you next time.